I can't even think of it. Same old difference? I'm not. It's only my business? I'm making it my business. All right, let's get back to this. Um, you talk to Scott Kenton, uh, anything to do with Kenton, and then... All right. The teacher says thank you, and that I'm privileged to have one that he would teach me so. What teacher said that? Ms. Andrew. Oh, you know. She's probably director of English at Mm-hmm. All right. You better know. So far, so good. And you've had to play Hamlet. The reason. Yeah. Okay. A lot of your problems are things that can't be repaired quickly and easily. You say the reasoning of this character may have been transformed by the changes in his life. I'm kind of big. What you really want to say is the reasoning of the protagonist may have become unbalanced. So you're using the wrong word here. You're saying it's transformed. Transformed means changed. Yeah. Changed in what way? Like the changes in his life. Uh, no, changed in what way? Unbalanced? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're looking at? Okay, then you say unbalanced. By changes in his life. What kind of changes? You have to foreshadow everything you say. You can't just say, you know, by the changes in his life, that's so vague. It, anybody could say that. You could say that about any play. So it's a weak thesis. It is a weak thesis. By the disastrous changes in his life. Why don't you say disastrous changes? Well, that's what you'll get to. That's your thesis. You don't have to say it. The state of melancholy shown or demonstrated, either one's okay, actually. But demonstrated is better. Why? Because it's, it's a question, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a better word. Demonstro, demonstrare. It means basically to show. It means the same thing. See, so that's why you don't want to try. Show, it means the same thing, yeah. Okay, well. But you see, a thesis is something that demonstrates what uh, you're going to uh, say. Uh, right. Caused him to protect. Okay. Ca caused him to procrastinate uh, I'm, I'm on his decision. Sneaky, I'm sneaky there. All right. Actually, procrastinate on his in his decision making. Isn't a thesis sort of an opening that gets you to? A thesis is not something that can be vague. I know, but it sort of gets you started. Good enough to, to go on. Right. Well, this isn't very intriguing as it stands. Yeah. Well, because we don't have problems you're using in America. That would, it was good enough for Don't use that as an excuse. I'm not, but, you know. In his decision making. Every time you say something, it has to be specific and concrete, not vague in general. If, if you want to be a comedian, you can be vague in general. If you want to be a writer, you have to be specific and concrete. Okay? He procrastinates on his decisions. You don't procrastinate on something. You procrastinate in something. And these are things you can find out by looking at your dictionary. Okay? Everything was left to time and change. Okay, that's pretty poetic, but that's not really very specific. <laughs> what was left to time and change? I like this. All actions were left to time and change. Well, I think he just has created. The clue that Hamlet gave us, which might convince us that Hamlet was also a victim of tragedy, was his ability to moralize his own actions. Yes, which is strong. Yes, that is, in fact, good. And I put a check mark next to it. Because that means real good? That's the best sentence in the whole thing. Oh, thank you. Because in order to moralize your own actions, you suck to be changed. Don't get too <laughs> proud of yourself, because even that <laughs> has its inadequacies. Uh, okay? Exactly. What exactly do you mean by moralize his own actions. I'm trying to tell you. Do you mean draw a moral from his own actions? Be able to focus, to make the... To rationalize his own yeah. actions? Yeah. Then why don't you just say rationalize? You know, the moral, moral is more stronger. No, it isn't. But he stands for something further than just rationalizing it. To rationalize his, his own actions. For the epitome of the principle of it. In a moral way. He's not okay? what I'm saying, though. You can't use moralize like that. Okay, but you see what I'm trying to say there, and I say it's more than rationalizing it, it's more something you really Then you really say, reason. then you say you rationalize it, and then you say, in what way do you rationalize it? In a moral way. 
because you can moralize to somebody, but you cannot use moralize in a reflexive sense. Remember when we were reflexive? In other words, it would be like saying, moralize myself. Can you say that? No. It's not a reflexive verb. Well, I don't know that. Okay. So, what you have to do, I don't, I don't know how you could have possibly have caught that, okay? But, t but trust me on this. It's much better to say his ability to moralize his own actions, to rationalize his own actions, in a moral way, okay? It's using the passive tense. Why? Because it's in a past tense. It's in a passive mode. Yes. Yeah. In a moral way. But nevertheless, there are times when using the passive is acceptable. And this is one of them. Well, my teacher told me that it's either all passive or all present. Mm. Well, like that. Well, yeah, you want to have a consistent voice throughout, but sometimes in order in order to away in more advanced in more advanced writing in order to avoid certain awkwardnesses sometimes it's okay to switch briefly okay. into a passive well, I would voice just tell that writer can do that no not necessarily any writer could do it it's just that you have to know but when you, when you obviously these rules are set in stone because what he doesn't want you doing is switching back and forth like some kid is discovering no, a new toy. No, I know that. Alright, so you should write either you should write largely in the passive tense using largely concrete verbs. Right, and that's my Okay. The thing is, sometimes there is a specific word for what you want to say. And the word that's not quite good enough it is not going to have the same impact. Right. Well that wasn't too bad for me, alright? So No, I'm not saying it was. Let's move on. Okay. In the Elizabethan era, not, not during the time that Shakespeare wrote the play Hamlet. Because we don't know what time that is. You know the general era in which he wrote it. You okay. don't know the... We're not sure that everybody else does. Mm. Right. So you don't know the exact year, but you can say what era. Roughly what time frame. The Elizabethan era. Leave it to the readers yeah, to figure like, out. You know, in years, actually. No. Because you don't, nobody knows exactly what year he wrote it. It would have been a mistake. You could have said... Okay. In the in during the time that Shakespeare wrote the play Hamlet, and scholars believe this was the well, approximately between 1595 right. and 1605. Right. Right. But the Elizabethan era is fine. You don't want to. Like, okay. Let's move on. I read the first page. Extreme nature. Let's move on. I want to ask you about All right. I want you to know that. But actually, I understand all this. Okay. Okay. So what do you need to ask? Well, I want to ask what the question is, or what's the question? I do some behavior I do all the time. I always put uh, a sort of creative tone at the end of stuff because I find it where I'm. What are you saying? Yeah. All right, I'll show you. A more better, like right in this line here. I want to see what you feel like. We have. He was normal enough to know exactly how to try and trap Claudius into showing his guilt of killing his father. Remember when we were talking about that? that dangling participle. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Remember we went over that and over that and over that? This is a perfect example of this. And this is why I'm so glad I have this here. Because, remember? We were saying someone could lose their minds. This isn't quite the same mistake, but it's similar. You have to say who is doing what. You cannot say things in such a way that there could possibly be any confusion as to what the pronoun refers to. We learned this in 11th grade. He, okay, we're talking about Hamlet, because Hamlet's right here. But when you have he, his, and his all in the same sentence, it cannot hurt to risk being redundant and use Hamlet's name again. Hamlet was normal enough to know exactly how to try and trap his uncle Claudius into showing his guilt for killing his brother, that is Claudius's brother, Hamlet's father. This way, what this could mean is he was normal enough to know exactly how to try and trap Claudius into showing Hamlet's guilt of killing Claudius's father, or is it Claudius is guilt from killing Hamlet's father. Specific, you want to say exactly what you mean, yeah. and nothing else. The thing is, you don't tend to say things 
There isn't very much here that's been crossed out that's entirely irrelevant. Every sentence carries its weight. It's oh. not it's not so much the sentences that are a lot of people have the fault of like being so in love with their own voice and their own rhetoric that they just go on and on and babble and, and that's say that's and, they did that. And, and right, and you did successfully. Good. You have been successfully. Let's just go through this line by line. No, it takes too long. No, it doesn't. That's not necessary. Well, I want to have a favorite and let you sing. No, that's what you just repeat. You have about ten more minutes then, all right? Oh, you're taping this? Yeah, we're, we're going through this line, mm -hmm. not line by line, okay? All right, listen. The first glance, whose first glance? Our first understanding. A glance of understanding? That's sort of an arrogance that you said? No. Glan I'm not sure that one glances understanding or understands in a glance. That's needlessly vague. Why well, you said, uh, you say, uh, use the computer to give you some grammar, um, sort of some syntax. Uh, syntax. Syntax. Um. And it didn't glance. Well, Okay, that's poetic though, needlessly so. Yeah, I'm trying to be poetic because a shoe, the whole thing works. A shoe excess verbiage. A shoe superfluous, superfluous I it was, it was, verbiage. It was right now, so. A shoe ostentatious erudition. That means Too much. avoid needless learnedness. Okay. Learnedness that is not needed yeah, in its context. No, that's not such a big deal. But it would be better to say our first understanding of Hamlet's sadness appears well into appears into, not in. Well into when you say when you modify in by using well into, that's good, because you're giving a condition of into or in. That's why well, that's the kind of stuff I'm weak on, uh, knowing that transition. Okay. What you have to do is look at an English grammar and figure out what like goes with what. Yeah. What is it? Appears well in two. Um, syntax. Like syntax. That's an error right there. Well, you said that it's of a word, right? Um, it's not that serious. You could say, our first understanding of Hamlet's Sabbath appears somewhat, some of the part of the way in two. See, the, when you're making me um, this is an accusative case. I don't want to even get into this. Certain prepositions take certain words. Oh, hey, I'm not, I don't want, I'm not going out. Lay down, Mama. Sit. Sit. Sit down, Sue. No, Mama. Sit down. Sit. I'll take it off. 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 No. I don't want to get into every line. All right. Can read okay. All right. All right. We've got to do this. I could find all these because that's what I'm going to do my thesis on. That would have been more relevant to this. It's possible to read it through some of this. You start to wonder if there is much more than normal sorrow and natural grief, okay. which is going on. Okay. This is what my next school teaches for me. You've got to leave it. You've got to always bring this last line to, to bring you over as a thought. Yeah, that's what you did. I'm not questioning. Oh, that really came in. That stuck. I'm not questioning your methodology. No, but the method is what I was perfecting. I think more so than the other error there in there. So the one part I don't like at all. In fact, if I was to edit this again, it's on the page today, I believe. Okay. I knew what I was doing too. Again, this this thing here. This is probably okay as it stands, but it's about a short paragraph. Yes, it's strong. And as they say, for proof. Yes. The same as the idea of the original and cause. And by showing us that Hamlet, seen as normal soldier and prince, can also be seen in the psychology. Yeah, I'm looking at a strong thought there. During the Elizabethan era, this, the following profile, 
this one seems like you've got a little file and a long file that you can describe. Alright. Okay, this is a very fine one, such a person. The either one's fine, but I think it's such a person. Who put that part on the not like and was actually here. Okay. This is kind of like the example of, uh, I don't like this right now. Right. It's There's another way to say it. it is well to know. You can say let us know. Yeah, that's what I was doing. Yeah, I right. forgot to you switch it around. Well, All right. It is good to know that Shakespeare's portrayal of melancholy and humor comes. I always prefer strong verbs. I always prefer specific verbs to non-specific verbs. Instead of using to be, you know, or to have. Like instead of saying it is or he has, say okay, he I, I possesses, get, 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 he comes. Right. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about enclosed clauses. When there's a but, almost always there's going to be a comma after it, especially if it's followed by a separate thought, which is not a complete okay, okay. sentence. Oh, you, know what enclosed, uh, you know what an enclosed clause is? No. An enclosed clause is a separate thought, which is not a complete sentence in and of itself, I which, awesome. if you were to leave it out, would not alter the sentence in any way. Such an enclosed clause okay, yeah. is always separated yeah. by commas. Okay, and that's a good way to put it. They're not opposite, though. It's what they, they don't run together. They don't, they don't go together. What you should do is look these terms up in a dictionary. Like when you have to memorize definitions. Well, okay, not good. so let's talk about irony. Irony, that's a good definition. Irony is when the implied meaning is the opposite of the literal meaning yes, and vice implied. versa. And what do they mean by implied meaning? They mean what um, what the subtext. Is, oh, the they call it subtext. What, we mean. what you say and what you mean are two different things. And irony is a relatively recent, well, no, it's a re relatively recent invention. It only came in about the 1500s. Prior to that, it's many, it and it's very similar to sarcasm, actually. Yeah, I agree. And okay, that's, that's however, sarcasm is ancient. It goes back to the that's ancient right. Greeks. Now, sarcasm is, oh, you're a real, you're a real bright girl, aren't you? Uh, way of no. I'll need another one from the Oh, that's nice. Did you make it at the store over there? Oh, you're creative. Oh, I love this person. Oh, that's so pretty. Oh, you're so pretty. Okay, let's see. So you wanted to go over page three, right? I've only read the first month. No, it was page one. Page five? Oh, okay, yeah. All right. Oh, yeah. Okay. You don't. You don't. You don't say. You don't say that Awkward. something is with this girl. You say it's along with her. Mr. Stockwell, you totally agree. That's necessary with me to say you're great, but she's not a writer. Slowly became destroyed isn't strictly wrong, but it's better to say is slowly destroyed, and that's that's like the. How can you use that present? That's the present because you can. Yeah, no, you can. Okay, if something is an ongoing process which is occurring in the past tense, oh, then you... Oh, that's, 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 that's in the first five pages of that grammar lesson we went over earlier. That's what, that's what my problem is. I understand yeah. there's inefficiencies. I understand that, you know... It's not an idiosyncrasy. Yes, it is. It's built it into the grammar. But for me it is, for the first one. All right, think of it this way. That's my mind. You are slowly growing more and more bored. You are at the present time, slowly becoming more and more bored. You are presently becoming a condition which is ongoing and yet takes place in the past. I don't have a well, I don't remember any of that. Don't feel bad. Put that out, will you? I, I put a lot of people, a lot of, good, a lot of people are never taught that. I'm like a little bit These are just typos. You know, these are just things you learn. Yeah. Gertrude. I like this part. Okay. I'm doing my own words. All right. Gertrude. 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 Gertrude.
expire as good food. See, the thing is, she definitely <coughs> did expire. She just died she died. slowly. Okay, she from slowly. Of herself, of now, people will tell you not to use too many adjectives, but you must not go the opposite route and use no adjectives well, or adverbs. You know why this? Okay, is this is slowly is slowly an adjective or an adverb? It's kind of an adjective. No. Now it's starting to move. Yes. There's two ways you can tell the difference between an adjective and an adverb. Well, One is. Describes the noun when it's Okay, an, ad, an adverb always describes a verb. Secondly, an adverb almost always has ly at the end. Whereas an adjective, in English, English is such a flexible language that you can use a verb as an adjective, you can use another noun as yeah, an adjective. Complexity of English language. It is complex. So what word would have been better? No, slowly dies, it's fine. That's all. Well, no, it's, you say, you say she just dies, and that's probably okay, but some people would... Well, at the end of it, I watched it in the video, and she, it's like, the yeah. instance of her love, she drank the poison. You know what I'm saying? I've seen it symbolically. Yeah. And it was, it was a naive, innocent move, because she loved so much, John and... Okay, no. her death is cemented. It's not really cemented, it's caused. Caused by the uncaring cynical realm, which I she and Hamlet got. All right, now, this is uh, an example of ending a sentence in a preposition. Do you understand what a preposition is? No. Okay, in, of, about, over, around, within, near. Those are all prepositions. Why? Because they act in the same way that pronouns act for nouns. A pronoun is a way of saying a noun without repeating the same noun over and over. It's very Francis is giving very a grammar lesson. He is telling her okay. what grammar okay. is. He is a pronoun. Okay, and, and it's the same thing with a preposition. Like they know I'm clear, but okay. they don't and, and the yeah. same thing with a preposition. And you should try to avoid ending a sentence in a preposition. Okay, it's, I, 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 I'm not saying that you can't but, ever. But, but it's good to do that. No, no, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. All right, let me, you, let me tell you an anecdote to wrap this up. Um, Winston Churchill once ended a sentence in a preposition, and someone called him to account for it. And he said, this is Aaron's pedantry with which I will not put up with. Up with which I will not put, he said. This is Aaron's pedantry up with which I will not put. See, he was saying, well, no, he was, and he, what he was doing was saying, there are occasions when it sounds more natural to end a sentence and a preposition. Well, yeah, to instantly like come back with that. Actually, he said he, this is something he said. It's not something he wrote. He said, uh, "The Honorable Chairman." Well, I hope you're having a fine old time. I certainly am. Listening to myself give my fifth grade grammar lesson. First part two. Well, it's just because you said of instead of have. Well, it does. It the same thing. Okay. Of is a preposition, not a verb. Well, I don't know that. In spoken language, you can say it may have come from. But of really means it may have. May have. If you would put the problem. Oh, the verb in there. May have. See? See how may have sounds like may of? Okay. That's the mistake you made. Well, what you really mean is may have. When you're writing it out, you don't say may of or may of. Mm -hmm. You say may have. Well, do you like this, this line here? Here. Yeah. I like that. You're, but you're, um... <coughs> that was a clear spot. No, well, you're hypnotized by your use of alliteration. Do you know what alliteration is? <laughs> no. Alliteration is when you use a similar vowel sound. Man yeah, of melancholy. That's alliterative. Son of sorrow, that's alliterative. Now, you must know, you must be aware of the distinction between alliteration and assonance. All right? That is an example of alliteration. This 
here's an example. Of course you would have caught that. Everybody would have caught it. Any English major could tell you the same thing. Have you caught a call? All right. That is an example of assonance. Assonance is just like alliteration, except assonance is similar vowel sounds. I wasn't doing it correctly. I know you weren't. You were doing it subconsciously. It's hardwired into our ability to use grammar. Okay? But for every hundred people who know what alliteration is or have a vague idea, maybe one knows what assonance is. Okay? So how would you have said that? Same. I would say it exactly that, that way. So you, so you instinctively know that that's a good way of saying it. Alliteration, when used in moderation, can be a very effective rhetorical device. You want to bring it over next day, go on. On a key camera. Right, I don't know if it would or not, but... No, I think it would be Now, why did you put a comma here? I'm out of the thought. This is an example no, of not. an independent clause as opposed to a dependent clause, okay? I was thinking of a different thought there. That's why you use a comma. That is entirely correct. If we think of Hamlet himself, I also might consider that melancholy was Hamlet's connection to a diseased world around him. That is exactly what I felt. That, that is an independent sentence. Therefore, you use it to join a dependent clause. So when this is a dependent clause, and that's another rule of grammar. If you have a dependent, if you begin a sentence with a dependent clause, and if you have two clauses in a sentence, one is dependent and one is independent, a comma always follows the dependent clause. Okay? So you instinctively knew that, even though you couldn't have said it. Okay, it seems that Shakespeare has, it's a weak verb, not in the classic grammatical sense of irregular verb. This is a, it seems that, it seems Shakespeare uses, and it might be better if you say it seems that. This is an example of, I'm not even going to get into what exactly that, what function that serves, but take it from me. <laughs> when doubt stick in, it seems that, it seems as if, it seems as though, you can get away without using that, and apparently he didn't mark it because it's too nitty. Yeah, I know what the meaning of it is. I'm trying. I'm focusing on stylistic subtlety. Okay. It's not the meaning of it. Isn't it? Okay. Because you gave the guy full name. Yeah. Um, oh, because I really said lion. So. Well, it's um, it's not lion. Wrong. 
the evil is perfect. I'm just telling you a subtlety in English that if you want to emphasize a dependent clause, you use dashes. If you want to de-emphasize it, you use a parenthesis. Oh, good. I know you. Well, no. If you if you don't want to emphasize it, if you specifically are only using I it like as. To emphasize that, though. All right. No, 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 no. Okay, then you should have probably said the most significant setting the graveyard scene was. Okay. Now you must know the difference between M dashes and N dashes. M dashes are easy to remember as such because they have an M has two humps, right? And an M dash has two humps. It's it's two dashes together. An M dash is never used as a dash. It is never used to separate a dependent clause. An M dash is used to make compound words like um, right, yeah. fail compulsive. Right. That's an M dash. Or graveyard. No, that's pretty good. No, those go together. And yeah, that's a dash. Uh, an M dash, an M dash yokes. Okay. I understand that. All right. An M dash yokes two words. An M dash separates a clause. I want to say that, you know, he was trying to was simulating that, that we perhaps as humans would think this kind of thing is true. So that was the whole idea of of showing maybe the the quad of humor I had of using medical as okay. I wanted to simulate that we should think that's what this guy's doing. He's always had a sort of trick of, of words. Well, here's another example where you use a parenthetical clause. However, or a dependent clause in parentheses. That's all a parenthetical clause is. That's how you describe it. Okay. You didn't need to use the parentheses here. Why? Because you're not necessarily de-emphasizing. It's not really an aside. I'm talking about starting that clause. Okay. It, yeah, I know, but it was an integral part of the sentence. You weren't, you weren't like whispering it off to the side. I wanted to remind you. Think of it this way. You had to write it like you didn't have to I know. No, what I'm saying is, there is no sign that has nothing to do with that. What this has to do with is, when you put this in parentheses, your instinct for sound, he suggests, okay, Shakespeare, depending on what is a melancholy character, he suggests, I suggest, you suggest, he, she, it suggests, Okay. See, that's the example of the subject agreeing with the verb. Okay. You must always make sure that the subject agrees with the verb. Yeah. Yes, I hope so. Yeah. He suggests to us that Hamlet's problems might be caused by Hamlet's morbid imagination. Now he suggests to us that it might be, it might buy Hamlet's imagination. It might be, not buy. What is by? What figure of speech is by? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a preposition. Um, a preposition serves as the function of an adjective which helps define a verb, helps define the action oh, of probably, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll write it out for you, just in case it's not there. Okay. Alright, bye. Never mind, never mind. God, I'm not saying that's wrong. Is a preposition. It's not a preposition. It's 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 a preposition. Refine. Okay, an adjective describes a noun. An adverb describes a verb, but a preposition is like a helper. Okay, you know, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. You know, um, something isn't just caused, it's caused by something else. Okay. By is a preposition. Alright, it's a helper. Yeah. Did you say Isaiah last 
Yeah, I know exactly what it's saying. Okay. Instead, it takes this hammer. Whenever it's something like instead, that's a dependent clause. Even though it's only one word, it's a dependent. Well, it's just a... So I'll put a comma after instead. Instead, takes this hammer, it's probably ready for the reader to see how a world of circumstances can affect everyone. There's nothing wrong with this sentence except that you put, you not put a comma there. And you must put a comma after a dependent clause. This is an independent clause. Why? Because it is a full, complete sentence. Shakespeare's Hamlet was probably written for the reader to see how a world of circumstances can affect everyone. This is a dependent clause. Why? Because it does not stay alone. It is dependent upon this clause, even though it precedes it. So, a comma always follows a dependent clause. I'll write that out for you. If you were to say you won't see that, the content looks good to you. Uh, I never really thought that kind of stuff in a while. Okay, we'll just go over this last sentence here. I want to believe it was something already inside each individual player that Hamlet just allowed. In other words, I might like to suggest to each other reader Take a good look inside us, absolutely. We don't leave things too long to time and change. This is one of the few examples where you say that in one part, part you say too little, and in another part you say more than you need to say. This, I know. Well, then that's exactly the place you should not do that. I want to believe it. What? The medical aid. Okay. I want to believe that it was the condition of a diseased world recognized by each major character in the play. Was it recognized by each character? Um, no, it wasn't. Okay. Um, then here's what you would do. You would put recognized or not recognized. And you could, depending on how you want to emphasize that, you can either make it a parenthetical clause enclosed by parentheses or separate it by dashes. In, in this case, I would separate it by dashes because it is, the, it is significant enough that it would either recognize or not recognize by each major character in the play. Alright. So it would not be recognized or unrecognized. Right. Yeah. I want to believe that it was the condition of a disease world recognized or not recognized by each major character in the play. It's kind of a long thing. Yeah, it's a long thing. Then you have, have to think of some way to break it up. Right. I have a problem around that which Hamlet simply I want to believe that I don't know maybe um I don't like the word stimulated it's like third out with stimulated I think it's the stronger she did affect everything that was in front of them because I love them I want to believe that it was the condition of the disease world recognized or not recognized each major character in the play, which was the motivating force which Hamlet simply aroused. But in whom did he arouse it? In the individual person, of course. Yes. That's just so that's, him, I There's an even better way of saying that. He might arouse you at some you would, you would begin this by saying, could it be that say, Hamlet simply aroused the recognition? What did, okay, you can put it as a rhetorical question. What did Hamlet arouse in each character of the play? Was it the condition of a diseased world? Yes. If Hamlet speaks to us today, perhaps it is because we too leave things too long. We comma two comma enclosed clause leave things too long for time and change. Time and change change is is can you enough to understand? Where did you get that phrase? In my head. Good. It's a very good. You could have time. You could have called it time and change in Hamlet if if you were speaking more to that specific aspect of it. No, but I was speaking to Turn it counterclockwise. Time and change is a time and change is the 
central motivating force in every work of Western drama that has come down to us as classic. Yeah, well, that is the classic theme of all plays from Aristophanes on up. From Sophocles and Aristophanes to Shakespeare and Bernard Shaw. Well, yeah, I mean, it got, something got done this year. Yeah, it did. Because I was going to Well, you instinctively recognize something which. So, uh, Sorry that all you have to look at is a boring window. Maybe there's school children that you can spy upon. Maybe we can darken it a little. There we go. Well, we still have some time left, and uh, so I'll slow this down. If it's in fact, it is appropriate, which it probably is not.
have found this particular case and you say, well, that, that's pretty good. That, that, that's what I have to learn. I'm going to put this into my brain and throw out the other one. Is it you? Or what happened to that? What, is, what may have happened to that case? Did that case get overturned somewhere? Did it go to a higher authority? Who knows? So? The bank. Now you open this book here, and I don't know about you, I can do it this way, uh, I can do it this way, you know. Um, okay. Thank you. Before we get up to six seven, you're going to have it going. All right. Now, this is the, this is called Shepherd Sunday. Okay. In case four, there's a digest which leads you into a companion case report. Got it? No? No. Okay. You don't want to This is what? This is the Atlantic Digest. Where is it? He has his Atlantic report. It's just this one box. And then the third part of it, notice you start with almost somebody starts with the Digest. It goes into the report. It picks up the case. And if it looks really good, uh, you want to make sure that that case wasn't on the move or in some way changed. So it goes to this guy. Yeah, a little tough. About 100 years ago, out in the uh, Midwest, that's in New York, and now they're out in Colorado. Anyway, this is the Shepherd Sun Center for the Atlantic Report. And if you look at the handout, there's a shot out of it. And you see on the lower right, there's volume 618. Mm -hmm. And volume 618, and then you can go to one. Mm -hmm. Okay. That case below that one mm -hmm. is in some way addressed. 618. You got it? Yeah. And volume 670 of the Atlantic Report of Second Series. On page 1300, forget about the case. On page 1300, that case, that subsequent case, in some way referred back to 618 Atlantic Second Plus. Yeah, and that's pending. That is addressed the 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 tenth uh, aspect. The tenth aspect. No, you don't. Four. 